Sometimes we make the mistake of not keeping what Jesus said in context. I've been teaching for years that Jesus didn't forgive anyone. Let me restate that. I've been teaching for years that Jesus did not forgive anyone. I've been teaching that he was not teaching that his father or God, quote unquote, forgave anyone. However, we do have various problems that is within our English reads that would suggest otherwise. I can promise you that is in starting to teach or question the idea of forgiveness that is as we understand in the classical setting of historical Christianity, most people would say, well, Dr. Jones, Jesus did forgive. Look at the language, namely, of our translation models. They would even articulate, look at the language of the Greek, and you should be able to see readily that Jesus was forgiving, God was forgiving. And I completely disagree with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read some of the prose that, is, that are very much against me. I'm not afraid of opposition. I think that Jesus, that is in the way that he taught, he was more than willing to make one of his apostles. Actually, one he referred to as Satan, he wasn't afraid to have various Satans uh, as his apostles. He wasn't afraid of taking theology itself on as a devil. He wasn't afraid of taking that devil and teaching a devil, using the devil. And so in a very strange sense, Jesus uses satanic languages and does teach principles that are good. It's very much like mythology. Mythology is a myth. And yet at the same time, we can benefit from mythology. We can take things that we make up and put together principles to teach our children. We can do this with fiction, mythology. And it's true that fiction and mythology are not necessarily one and the same. Sometimes they can be one and the same. It depends on how one is using mythology and fiction, etc. The point that I'm making is that the church became convinced that Jesus was teaching that we must understand that God is the one who did or does forgive us. And this, this is mostly based upon the premise of a theology that was already in existence before Jesus ever came, that is, as this little baby in a manger. If we examine Matthew 6, and this is found after Matthew 5, I'm not trying to be sarcastic here. I'm simply trying to make a point of emphasizing the nature of chapter 5. The nature of chapter 5 is to indicate that I came to you, and please understand chapter 5 is not about teaching just anyone. He's actually teaching legal students. So when we read, I didn't come to destroy the law, the law, excuse me. In other words, verse 17 of chapter 5, don't assume that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. Who is he teaching? Is he teaching people who don't want to be students of the law? He's teaching people who very much want to be the students and also the teachers of the law. And so, in a sense, we're talking about a classroom full of law students. And if you can picture yourself, if you want to understand the read, go to any kind of law school and listen to those professors and listen to how they spin things. Sometimes they get extremely critical, sarcastic. They use tongue-in-cheek, things of that nature, simply to make points. And so this is why Jesus was simply dealing with forensics here, in a sense, judicial issues. And so when he tackles the issue of the law, he continues, he said, 
For I assure you until heaven and earth pass away, and please understand that if we understand the language flux of such an argument in law, heaven and earth have nothing at all to do with, quote unquote, this earth that we stand and sit on. We're talking about a heaven and earth that's quite metaphorical. It's something that is very esoteric, that is understood by those people called the Jews. It was a very exclusive kind of uh, figurative language. I'm going to spend some time treating that because you won't understand the idea of heaven and earth in Genesis chapter 1 unless you understand the method and the manner in which these legal students would pitch heaven and earth uh, terminology. We're not talking about a science program here. We're talking about how they dealt with their quote-unquote Mecca, that is Jerusalem. But back to the text here, it says, For I assure you until heaven and earth pass away, he's not talking about physical earth or physical heaven. He's not even uh, remotely close to that. Now, if you were a legal student back in those days, you would understand that this is true. And so he's, he's trying to get these people to get on edge. He's pushing the envelope, teaching these students something. He says, not the smallest letter or one stroke of the letter will actually pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Now, there are various other ways of stating this, obviously. This is only one rendition and we have this conclusion that we must pay attention to in verse 19. He says, Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands or commandments and teaches people to do the same thing, that is to break these commandments, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And please keep in mind that the referent point of heaven here isn't the heaven that we talk about after we die, we're talking about a heaven that's very, very much a part of their rhetoric that is in their system of teaching law. And so we're not talking about going to heaven somewhere. We're talking about their heaven, their Mecca. Please keep in mind that when it came to the resurrection, only part of the Jews even believed in the resurrection. The rest of these people didn't even have a concept of that. And those people that did or who did actually, did believe in a resurrection. It was very limited in scope. And so the idea that we have today in the church of heaven, oh, we're going to heaven, we read that right into the text. And that's spurious to the text here. It has nothing at all to do with the text. Can you imagine people writing about heaven like we think in Western countries in our western system of logic we're talking about heaven going to heaven one of these days and we hear this person at first baptist church do you want to go to heaven jesus fulfilled the law look at it it's right there in your bible it's heaven it's heaven do you want to go to heaven and they get nervous about this trying to pitch let's go to heaven here's the ticket the reason that they're doing this it's because they understand nothing about law if they understood anything about the mosaic law and the students of the Mosaic Law and the teachers of the, of the Mosaic Law called the rabbis, they would understand that the rabbis don't think in these terms. And unfortunately, historical Christianity has gone nuts over something that they don't even understand. Verse 19, Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches people to do, so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, what are we talking about? The kingdom of what? If you'll do simply an analysis, that is, of lower criticism, that is, to look at the evidence of various gospels. We have four gospels here, but we have other gospels that are subsequent to the read of what we call the quote-unquote Bible. But you're going to find many of these writers exchanging terms. Some people will say, let's use kingdom of heaven. Other people will say, let's use kingdom of God. Other people like John will say, I'm not going to overuse kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. I'm simply going to use the idea of eternal life. Now, please understand, I'm only using a failed meta language to make a point. I'm simply saying that these writers are interchanging. They are swapping back and forth with ideas. One is saying, oh, it's the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven. Another writer is saying, it's the kingdom of God, it's the kingdom of God. Another writer is saying, it's eternal life, it's eternal life, it's eternal life. 
Now, when you do your homework, you're going to find that many of these writers are writing about the same thing, calling the same thing, simply naming the same thing by different terms. Why? Because this isn't a legitimate case of saying this is actually what Jesus said. Jesus wasn't speaking in Greek. He was speaking in that Aramaic. And so these people, namely the disciples, felt the comfort of actually transporting what Jesus said into Greek using various kinds of terms. They were used to taking and making an approach called an oblique model of transport. They were not using direct techniques at all like we find in the church. This is the reason that I keep saying that the church has failed much in every way when it comes to its text. Now, I'm not going to get complicated. I'm keeping everything very simple this morning. I'm going to make the point. In chapter 5, is he saying, I'm fulfilling the law, or is he speaking as a law professor, teaching law students? The latter would be true, because if you keep reading, you're going to find that he finally winds up stating, you've heard it stated, namely in the law, namely in the Mosaic law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you something quite different. So arguably so, the conclusions that he makes as a professor to those law students, he makes the claim that the premise of the argument of fulfilling X, Y, and Z would be nonsense. This is why he claims that you've heard it also stated that what? You've heard it stated that, oh, love your neighbors, but hate your enemies, but I'm telling you something quite different. And so this was very much in keeping with the rhythm of how a professor, that is, of law, we could call him simply a rabbi, one who was adequate, well acquainted with the law, capable of dealing with their type and kind of rhetoric. This is what Jesus was doing, dealing with their rhetoric. So he's not afraid to approach that. The reason that most people are convinced that uh, Jesus forgives, and please understand that they also believe that God forgives, is because what necessarily follows is chapter 6. Let's look at chapter 6, verse 5. And let me deal with my devil before I start complimenting the angels from heaven. In chapter 6, verse 5, excuse me, in chapter 6, verse 5, we find whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. So Jesus isn't using the kind of language that is a compliment. He said, you know, when you want to communicate, please note that I did not say pray. Praying is an idea that the church has gotten a hold of. You get on your knees and you start begging and pleading. And somehow if you beg and plead long enough, God will answer your prayer. You need to ask yourself the question at some point in time, if you have to beg and plead, stomp your feet, intercede, do all of that to your father. What kind of father do you have? So is Jesus actually coming along and saying, oh, we have this father. This is, this is how you need to pray. Please understand that he's still talking with law students as a professor. Now, he's not suggesting let's cover everything A to Z in one classroom, that is, in one day or even in one semester. No professor today says, let's learn of all of medical science in one day or even in one semester. No, he is setting up prerequisites for knowing something that he will say possibly two to three years later. His lifetime of teaching was three and a half years. And we're making a mockery of the model of what he taught in the last six months if we don't understand the prerequisites and the things that he was targeting within the first six months to 12 months of his ministry that is here on earth by tackling the subject of the law. But it's apparent that he comes out swinging, being extremely sarcastic. 
So note chapter 6, verse 5, whenever you pray or communicate. He's not just talking to average people. He's talking to Jews. These Jews are very esoteric in their theology. They leave the Gentiles out. Yet at the same time, they plagiarize the pagans when they want. And they even practice a form of paganism. The Jews never practice monotheism for the most part during their history. Let's examine this again. Whenever you pray, and please understand that I'm reading from an extremely failed meta-language of theology, this pitiful translation. I'm simply reading from it because it's something that you can adjust to. The same thing is true with Jesus. He was not speaking accurately what was actually in those, uh, those various authored scrolls. He was simply saying, we have an object, let's move on. This is what you're dealing with. Uh, based upon oral tradition, current understanding of your principles of law. So let's have a chat. Let's talk about how we communicate. You must not be like the hypocrites. Don't be hypocritical. Because they love to pray standing in the synagogues. Now, who were those who prayed in the synagogue? You're going to find those who prayed in the synagogues were those who followed modeled ideas concerning prayer that were concerning the ideas of law. So is Jesus once again being sarcastic toward those who practiced the Mosaic law that is in principle and regulation? They had regulations for prayer, namely in the synagogue. Jesus is stating without hesitation. These people are hypocrites. In other words, they are not being completely honest with the God who actually exists. This isn't a compliment to their system. This is very much something that he's trying to get them to see. He's trying to nuance a bit. Because they love to stand and pray, namely in the synagogues, and on the street corners to be seen by people. So is he applauding the idea of this kind of prayer that was instituted or made very useful in the kinds of prayers that you would necessarily follow in formal Judaism? Not at all. In fact, he's mocking the prayer life and the models of prayer life of those who practice Judaism. Go back and study your history. These people prayed in a certain way, and if they did not conform to this, they were actually put to death. Read your history. I assure you, they got their reward. In other words, when they were doing it, Everybody was applauding what they were doing because they all thought they were right. They were stuck in a theology. They thought they had a concept of the law. They applauded it. But that's as far as it went. So is Jesus saying, that's all they got? They can't move forward. That, that's all there is to it. There's no more than just standing on the street corner, standing in the synagogue. That's as far as it goes. It, it, it goes no further than that. That's it. He says, but when you pray, when you communicate, he said, go into your private room. So in a sense, is he telling people, you don't need to go to the synagogue to do what they do? Is he saying it's all right to be personal? That is in your relationship, that is in your communication with God? Wow, what a concept. So simply go into your, you know, into your closet. You can shut the door, in fact, and you can pray to your father actually without anyone else knowing about it. You don't have to tell the rabbi or 
various other people. This is fine. So in a sense, is Jesus trying to create a paradigm of liberty? That is, why don't you learn this? You don't have to go before the priest and confess. You don't have to go and lay down X, Y, and Z. You simply can do this in private. Those things in your mind that you're too embarrassed to tell other people, why don't you speak to one who will keep things in confidence, won't embarrass you. If you tell someone that you actually picked up wood on the, on the Sabbath, you might have a God who won't stone you. And so what Jesus is doing, he's actually meddling a bit with law students. And please understand, these people called the Jews, very brilliant, that is, in language. Most of these kids, by the time that they were five years old, they knew various languages. Unfortunately, today, it's hard to find people who know one. It's true that most of them could not read or write. They didn't have the luxury that we have today with pen and paper. But they were learning. But orally, they were geniuses in a sense. And so we can't diminish that. And so in a very strong way, in a very stern way, Jesus is dealing with something orally that needs to be understood. That is to contextualize what's happening here. As we move forward, and I'm going to do this quickly, and by the way, once again, I will not get finished. I'm barely going to get started. But I will say this over and over again. Jesus is not teaching us that God forgives. Jesus is not teaching us that he forgives. He's teaching people that you need to rise above what forgiveness is. Let's keep reading. In verse 7, he states, not Jesus, but one of those translators of Jesus. Not just one of those translators of Jesus, but one of those translators that take it out of Greek into English. So we're actually reading English Jesus. And please understand, you need to give English Jesus a little bit of latitude. Don't get so dogmatic. Don't try to develop a doctrine out of this. People who try to, to develop dogmatics and doctrines are normally those people who are, who are extremely failed. Learn how to be a person of question. Learn how to be an honest one. Leave enough room for possibilities. You might learn something. Verse 7. When you pray, don't babble like the idolaters, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Who's he referring to? Is he referring? You know, the referent here doesn't go uh, into the concepts of, 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 of those people in practicing the pagan rituals but it goes into the concepts of those people who are actually practicing Judaism or Judaism and what he's actually saying is in principle you guys are practicing the same thing that the pagans did so I feel the liberty to say this is very much idolatry as we continue they use many words he said, don't be like them. And please understand, some people sometimes feel very inadequate because maybe they don't, they don't feel like they are as intelligent as the student next to them. They don't have as many words to say. And this is very comforting because Jesus is simply saying, it doesn't take a lot of words. It may not take one. Please keep that in mind. As we continue to read this meta language, this failed meta language, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words, don't be like them because your father knows the things that you need before you ask him. So the question is, in the context, 
is Jesus stating that whoever this father is, the father, the father quote unquote, already knows before you even ask. In other words, is it really essential to say anything? That is, by the utilization of speaking. If your father already knows something, isn't it true that maybe you can simply go into your secret closet and, and simply, you know, be quite short and say, you know, Father, you already know. I, I really don't need to remind you. See, it's, it's learning how to communicate with someone who knows what you're going through without struggling with the condemnation. It's difficult. You know, we as human beings, we, we struggle with each other all the time because we're always trying to inform the other person. Most of you guys have been in a fight, a fussing match, that is. We're always trying to tell the other person X, Y, and Z. Jesus is simply coming along and saying, you know, with this father, he knows X, Y, and Z. You, you don't need to struggle here. If you have problems, and you do, you, you don't need to struggle. You just simply need to, you just simply need to get relaxed. You don't, need to even, you don't even need to be in the synagogue, by the way. That's powerful. You can simply be, you know, you can go in your closet, away from your family. No one else needs to know. In the most secret place of you, you can simply, you can communicate with this Father. That's powerful. This is unheard of. In Judaism, you see, the priests had to be in the know. You were connected to the priests so much so that, you know, these priests had to deal with your inadequacies year after year. They had to do it with blood. I keep telling people I don't believe that the blood of Jesus accomplished anything concerning my sins, that is, in the classical setting of theology. When Jesus shed his blood, he was simply shedding his blood because people were beating him beyond recognition. The only reason he was beaten beyond recognition is because he allowed it to be so. He laid his life down willingly not to become a human sacrifice to satisfy his maniacal father who needed to forgive us of our sins, that is, those sins he was keeping against us. He wasn't doing that at all. What was he doing? He was simply a person who was telling us, listen, love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. In fact, love operates like this. It's not an eye for an eye. It's not a tooth for a tooth. When an evildoer comes your way, you don't even resist them. You don't fight back. Sometimes we feel like fighting back with our enemies. And I'm not, con I'm not convinced that if we can't love and be kind to our enemies, I I'm convinced that we are just as violent as our enemies. If you can't be kind to your enemies, you're just as violent as your enemies. Jesus that day 2,000 years ago was proving to us this is the way that you treat your enemies. You're not violent to them. You're kind to them. When they beat you, you don't strike back, period. Your heavenly father knows what you're going through. You don't need to tell him anything. He knows everything. He feels your pain. Jesus is trying to connect God with humanity Theology has us so disconnected. We have God up here and man down here, and there's this big gulf in between us. And Jesus is trying to tell us, take the gulf out of the picture. God is in you. He's close to you. You, you, you can go in your, your closet, your, just your, wherever you are. You may be out in, in the forest or out in the desert. He's there. You can't get away from him. So once again, he becomes sarcastic. 
What do you mean he becomes sarcastic? I told you that I was going to teach my devil. In fact, I'm going to use my devil and my Satan. And please let me go on record. I am like Greg Bray. Greg Bray always says, and I like this, it's kind of grown to be his label, that is, for a show. I'm Greg Bray. I'm an atheist. Well, I would like to tell you that I'm Dr. Jones, and I'm an A. Satanist. An atheist is one who doesn't actually believe in God. He doesn't accept actually any of the things that, that God has actually revealed. I am a theist, but I am an a Satanist. That means I don't ever think that what Satan has ever said is of value. It's all myth. It's fabricated. There isn't a real Satan in a literal sense. It's all metaphor. Our real Satan is actually standing right there in the mirror when we stand before the mirror. Hopefully that some of you guys will get my point by understanding what I'm saying by claiming that I am an a-Satanist. Some people really believe in Satan. How unfortunate. Now, if you have a Bible like mine, you're told this is the model prayer. And here is my Satan right here. And please understand that I am very much a satanic. I added the end there for purpose of nuance. Listen to verse 9. Therefore, you should pray like this. When, when you read the Greek text, it's much different than this. And I will give a model that's richer in translation to this. Because please understand that every bit of what I've read thus far is all in, in a context of direct technique. It's not really dealing with anything that's being done with tropes, metaphor, etc., it loses completely the nature of what Matthew is writing. But I want to read it to you because this is the church's model of forgiveness. And I simply want to ask you to be honest with yourself. Do you really accept the church's model? If so, why? I'm simply claiming, in a sense, this is very satanic. Listen to this. Our Father in heaven. Now, to keep in context the heaven that he's in reference to in chapter 5, and he continues the, the same frame, is the heaven in the sense that he speaks in chapter 5, is that positive? Or is that a faux pas of those students and teachers of the law? Or does he go to another heaven? Oh, in principle, you know, if I'm a Southern Baptist or a Pentecostal or a Catholic, oh, this is heaven. I want to go there and I want to tell you and be quite clear, I don't want to go to the heaven that Jesus is speaking about in this context. I don't want to go there. This is, this is something that man fabricated. This is their Mecca. But Jesus is using their own system of legal language against them in order to become the stumbling stone. He's going to trip these people intentionally. He's going to get them to fall over their own language. Unfortunately, we in the West, we don't see that. Oh, yes, he became this stumbling stone, but, oh, I love the Gospels. This is all to be taken literal, and I understand it. Praise God. I'm going to those heavenly gates one of these days. It won't be long, thank God. And for some reason, we're just like Pavlov's dogs. We're salivating and desiring heaven, 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 please. Because Jesus told us to pray, our Father in heaven, Wow, hallowed be thy name. 
that should ring a bell if you're familiar with the structure of the law because in the law he's God Almighty. He's the one who will judge you. He's the God who will bless you. And yet he's the judge and God who will curse you. Oh, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. So once again, Jesus is using the rhetoric of those who want to be not just law students, but law professors. Very satanic, and yet at the same time, people claim this to be extremely theistic. It's unfortunate that people don't understand when Jesus is using tongue-in-cheek. I could ask the question, how many of you were taught in Sunday school this model prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. In a sense, that does this really make sense to the rhythm of what we just read about going into the closet? Does this make sense to the one who already knows everything? Does this make sense to what he was talking about? Briefly, for a brief moment, you're getting the idea that it's not about me using words. It's about my father already knows my needs and he's going to do something for me. In fact, if you read what other writers said, well after many semesters of listening to Jesus, they finally arrived at the conclusion, he has supplied all of our needs according to his riches and glory. He's already done all of this stuff. We just need to get to know him. We need to draw close to him. We need to realize he's inside. He's working these things out. And love doesn't even keep a record of wrong. Something's messed up here. There's a tension being created here for law students. And yet the Baptists, the Pentecostals, the Catholics, everybody's saying, let's quote this together, please. Our Father which art in heaven. I met with some Satanists one time and I said, let me give you a quote of a satanic passage. He said, are you a Satanist? I said, no, I'm a Satanist. I don't think that Satan exists. You guys are playing the fool's game, not me. What satanic passage are you going to quote? I said, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They were shocked. I said, can't you read? I thought you guys were great Satanists. If you want to see what is actually against Christ, learn to understand what Christ was talking about. Why am I making these statements? Read with me. For the sake of time, I told you I wasn't going to get finished. We've got a long way to go. Because please remember, the disciples were having a hard time because after the resurrection of Jesus, they're saying, hey, are you going to restore the kingdom back to Israel? They're still confused. They're still looking for satisfaction, that is, from a God who has been keeping in mind that, oh, those other nations took and stripped us of all of our property that we have been blessed with, and God somehow is going to reconcile that back to Israel. And Jesus is going, something's wrong here. They don't know what they're doing. They don't have a clue. Did Jesus actually say on the cross, Father, forgive them? They don't, have, they don't have a clue as to what they're doing? When you don't have a clue as to what you're doing, when you hear your father say, I forgive you, does that help? No. When you tell your father, Father, these guys, they don't have a clue as to what they're doing, you're simply telling your father they need some help. That's why office in the Greek means when Jesus was talking there on the cross, he said, Father, they need some help. They've got to be helped. They need some help. They don't need forgiveness.
They don't need someone to say, oh, I'm not holding anything against them any longer. That doesn't help them. They don't have a clue as to what they're doing. That's their problem. I'm not going to get sidetracked. Back to chapter 6. You can read thy kingdom come until your kingdom does come and you're still in Satanism. Maybe you're getting the point. Look at verse 14. For if you forgive people, oh, here's a condition. For all of you who want to read this and read this and read this in the synagogue or in the churches or in your prayer closet. What is the conclusion? Look at the conclusion. Listen to this law professor, Jesus Christ himself, tackling those students of the law and also those professors of the law. He said, for if you forgive people their wrongdoing condition, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive people, your Father will not forgive your wrongdoing. So God won't forgive you unless you forgive others. Now, who's the hypocrite in the context? So is God saying, oh, you need to forgive before I will? I'm simply saying that Jesus is pitching the God of Judaism as a hypocrite. He's pitching Yahweh as that one who has to have this kingdom to come and please understand the language flux here. These people were looking for the restoration back to Israel. This was really baiting them in a sense. Oh, you're looking for the restoration. You're looking for the restoration. This is why Peter was all worked up. I'll fight for you, Lord. They won't kill you. I'll cut that man's head off. Rightly dividing the word. Where are those in church life when you really need them? Let's get some people to rightly divide the meta language. We're not finished with this. But if you feel inside of yourself that a good father says to his children, listen, kids, I'm not going to forgive you until you forgive other people. If you think that's good parenting, I'm going to suggest that you find a psychiatrist. You need some help. Good parents, number one, they don't keep anything against their children. They don't hold a record of wrongs. When their children need help, they help them unconditionally. They love them unconditionally. They accept them unconditionally. They will die for them. That's what good parents do. Good parents don't say, if you won't forgive someone else, I won't either. This is sick theology. It's satanic. And I am an a Satanist. Thank you for your time.